Section 4.3 asks and answers the question, what is inside a router? So let's take a look at what happens inside a router. As an overview, a router does essentially is involved in two things. It involves, it's involved in routing, which is the global process of delivering packets over multiple hosts, and it's involved in forwarding, which is forwarding datagrams from ingoing links to outgoing links. These are the four components of a router. There are input ports, the switching fabric, output ports, and the routing processor. And here is an illustration of those four pieces. Note the input ports, um, which there may be many of. They're going to take the data and put that on the switching fabric, which actually will connect input ports to output ports based on data from the routing processors. The routing processor understands the forwarding table and implements that logic of how do I, what, um, what destination address or virtual circuit number is connected um, from ingoing to outgoing links. The switching fabric is where that actually happens, and the routing processor is the brains of the operation. The output ports are kind of the opposite of the input ports and in that they're, um, they reverse the process of uh, encapsulating, decapsulating the datagrams to send them out on the network. Let's look at an input port uh, in more detail. An input port it has these three components. It's going to accept packets at the physical layer, receive them at the bit level, and unpack them, pass them to the link layer. The link layer, something like Ethernet, is going to implement the link layer protocol and um, extract the frames into the datagrams that the network layer is interested in and pass that up to the network layer IP. Um, once we have the IP datagram, we can pass that to the switching fabric and let it do the switching based on the IP address. One thing to think about here is will buffering happen and if so how? So this switching fabric has to do a lot of work to connect input links to output links using the, the forwarding table that's in memory. The goal of the router is to complete the input port processing at the speed of the input port, at line speed. If datagrams arrive faster at all of the input ports than the forwarding rate of the switching fabric, then queuing will have to occur. That means we'll have to buffer packets as we're waiting for the switching fabric to become available. This slide illustrates three different switching fabrics that may be present, different ways that, uh, that these can be used. We could use memory basically copy a packet into memory and then copy it out of memory uh, to a different port. We could use a bus to actually um, transfer the, the packet from input to output. Or we could use something more complex, a more complex architecture like a crossbar, to actually make distinct, unique connections between input and output ports. Um, let's look at each of these in a little bit more detail. Switching via memory is, was implemented by first generation routers. Basically, they're regular computers that have a switching software under the direct control of the CPU. Um, instead of being special purpose computers, which are typically what you know, high performance routers would be now. Packets are copied into the system's memory and then copied out of the system's memory to go from input port to memory, memory to output port. Because of this, this is very limited in speed by the bandwidth of the memory. Because it takes two bus crossings per datagram, um, it's going to be pretty slow. So this is old and slow switching via memory, but it's simple. A bus is another way of doing this. In this scenario, we're going to switch directly over the bus. So datagram is switched from the input port memory to output port memory over a shared bus. Because of this, there will be speed, um, the switching speed will be slower because it's limited by the bus bandwidth. The bus bandwidth is the limiting factor here. How fast does this bus communicate? How many bits per second can it transfer? 
bus contention can occur when there are more uh, packets that need to be transferred than the bus can, in fact, uh, transfer yep. in some given period of time. Uh, the book says that there's routers from Cisco that operate at a bus speed of 32 gigabits per second on the bus, and that's sufficient speed for most access and enterprise routers. What if you want to go faster? Um, well, one way to do that is using this interconnection network. This is complicated, and therefore it's expensive, uh, but it's fast. So this is to overcome the bus bandwidth limitations. There are many different kinds of network architectures that are used to make it possible for there to be lots of different paths between source and destination, between input and output ports. Cisco has routers that do this, switches that operate at up to 60 gigabits per second over the internet, uh, the interconnection network. So that's saying that the actual switch in the middle of the switching, that does the switching fabric, is that fast. <coughs> Recall that it's important for this fabric to be fast enough, enough to keep up with all of the incoming port speeds all added together so that the packets aren't slowed down and aren't queued at the input ports. Now let's take a look at the output ports and how they work. For the most part, they work the opposite of input ports in that we take a network packet, we encapsulate it in the link layer, we take uh, a link layer frame and put that on the physical network using the physical layer protocols. Um, what if datagrams arrive from the fabric, the switching fabric, faster than the transmission rate of the output port? Now what if the switching fabric is sending packets on the output ports faster than they can send it. In that case, buffering is going to happen here as well. Um, what happens to those buffered packets? Well, they might get dropped if there's too many of them. Um, furthermore, we may need to have a scheduling policy to determine which packet do we send next. So the scheduling policy will choose among queued datagrams and choose one for transmission next. And that could be based on different policies. As we look in these different layers, you know the network layer is the IP. Um, it may manage the the queuing and the buffer management. The data link layer is going to be something like Ethernet, um, which will handle protocol decapsulation and the protocol of the Ethernet. And the physical layer is going to be concerned about bits and signals and waves. Let's take another look at how output port queuing can happen. Imagine that we're in this scenario where we have three input ports and they all end up switching across the switching fabric to this one output port. Well, what's going to happen if that output port can only send one of these three packets? Well, it's going to have to buffer the other two. So our sentence here means, when does buffering happen? Buffering happens when the arrival rate via the switch exceeds the output line speed. So this is going to cause queuing, and therefore it's going to cause delay and possible loss due to buffer overflow on the output. So here's an example of that. One packet later in time, um, if this packet down here needs to be sent on output link one, he's going to have to wait in line, or he's going to have to be lost if that buffer is full. How much buffering should we use? How much buffering should we supply for each of these ports? Well, there's a rule of thumb in RFC 3439 that says typically we want to have the round trip time times the link capacity. Um, and you can see how this is going to result. You can see in the scenario of a round trip time of 250 milliseconds and a, a capacity of the link of 10 gigabits per second that we're going to need two and a half gigabits of buffer. Recently, this recommendation has been tweaked um, and we divide it by the square root of n, where n is the number of flows. So this may or may not be useful if you're designing a router. You'd be interested in, in stuff like this. Uh, lastly, let's think about this thing called head-of-line blocking. All right, what happens? Can, how does input port queuing happen? Well, imagine that the switching fabric is slower than the combined speed of the input ports. 
So each of these input ports is, say, one gigabit per second. Our switching fabric is two gigabits per second. You can see it's possible we could have an input rate of three gigabits per second, but only the switching fabric only supports two. So when the fabric is slower than the input ports combined, queuing may occur at input queues. What is head of line blocking? Well, the head of line blocking is when a queued datagram at the front of the queue prevents others in the queue from moving forward. And this can also result in delay and loss due to buffer overflow. For example, imagine um, that we have these two red packets that get sent to the red output link, let's imagine, um, and the green packet that's behind it here is addressed to be on output link two. Because two packets get sent up here, and this packet is still waiting to be sent, the green packet is essentially blocked because um, it's still waiting for the, the red guy in front of it. It's, that's still queued because it couldn't be sent across the switching fabric. So be, when the switching fabric is slower, it may keep packets, um, it may delay packets sort of unnecessarily, where if, we, if, the red, if the green guy were ahead of the red, this red packet in line, he would be able to be sent out on this second port uh, but because this red guy is experiencing congestion, the green packets are going to be slowed down. So that is a brief look at what's inside a router. And we looked at the input, output, input ports, output ports, the switching fabric, and the routing processor, which implements the actual forwarding.